Advertiser unfriendly, advertiser unfriendly, advertiser unfriendly. Fine. Whatever. You guys win. I can't beat you. It's almost like the advertisers pay my bills or something. You know what? Here's the deal. I'm going to make the most advertiser-friendly video out there. Yeah, actually, that's not a bad idea. Let's do the top 10 best advertising campaigns ever. I think we all agree that most commercials tend to suck. Fuck. Really? Hey, you guys need to learn that advertising is like any other medium. It takes a lot of time, effort, and creativity to make good ones. Adblock wouldn't really even be a problem if most companies actually put a lot of time and effort into their advertising. Most ads today suck because companies don't really see this. They just want their brand name out there. And while buy my products is functional, people aren't going to be quoting buy my potatoes like they're asking where's the beef years later. Where's the beef? A good advertisement sticks in your brain. The best advertisements, however, get you to try and seek it out on its own. It's really paradoxical, actually. The best advertisements ever are able to stand on their own past the product they're trying to push. <laughs> Some of them stand on their own as stories, visual pieces of art, experimental films, or even a sense of fun. Yeah, actually, this list isn't just commercials. Any kind of advertisement campaign is on the table. Commercials work, but we're including everything from advert games to big, gaudy advertising stunts. Also, I'd like to say right off the bat, so this doesn't come up later, just because I'm endorsing these commercials doesn't mean that I'm endorsing the product. I'm only endorsing them as commercials on their own, as individual pieces of media. My opinion on Pepsi as a drink doesn't change that I think that Pepsi Man is a hilariously awful game. We're judging the advertisements on their own merits. And remember, even the best advertisements in the world can't make people actually like your product. With that said, let's push some product. Hypnospace is really, really cool. All the kids are talking about it at school. Before I begin, I should mention that this video is being sponsored by absolutely no one, and none of my videos ever have. It's not like I'm against YouTubers being sponsored or I have a moral imperative against that. After all, we've all gotta pay the bills, and YouTube itself doesn't really pay the bills so much. Especially with all of this going around. Honestly, if I found a good sponsor, I'd probably sign up and sponsor their product. The issue is that most people sponsoring YouTubers aren't products that I use, or I directly use their competitor. You see so many people advertising Wix. My website uses Weebly. Raid Shadow Legends? Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not advertising a mobile game when I hate smartphones in general. This is a discussion for another day, but whenever a company of any kind is trying to appeal to mobile users, that company is dead. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do a uh, PC. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones, phone. right? And then there's Dollar Shave Club. Do I look like a man that shaves to you? But I get why some people are annoyed when it comes to YouTubers advertising stuff. I mean, way, way, way back in the day, it was seen as being a sellout through and through. Then again, back in the day, making any money at all in any creative field was seen as being a sellout in general. But more often than not, people don't like YouTubers advertising things because it's largely always the same. People just delaying the actual video to ask if you've heard the good word about Raid Shadow Legends and want to join the cult. I think that YouTubers can be much better at this in fact, many of them have. Sometimes YouTubers will make a whole sketch video about a product that they've been paid to promote. ProCD is one YouTuber who does impressions about some of the bizarre choices in anime and video games. He's been paid to sponsor a few companies, notably Crunchyroll several times. Nothing's changed. It's been three years since Refrigerator Senpai killed Lamb Senpai and left our village. My outfit is now black because things are serious business now. In Cherim Anime! So but in my opinion, I don't think that any YouTuber does advertisement sketches better than Tomska. He's been paid to make quite a few sketches based on a number of products, and they tend to be no different from his regular sketches, which more often than not are very funny and high quality. Of course, some of the quote-unquote sketches are more serious, like when he was sponsored by the Childline Charity to make a video explaining porn to young people, and did a very good job at it. But I want to pretend that the advertiser-unfriendly battle hasn't been lost yet, so we're going to talk about Tomska's Oreos Commercial. Now, this isn't my favorite video by Tomska. There are plenty of great choices in that category, between the orb, the hole, or the muffin song, but it's hard to deny that this is a great video. This was part of the Play With Oreos campaign. The campaign was a nice little thing in order to sell more cookies. They made programs to show more things that you could do with Oreos than just eat them, like make recipes. 
or turn people into Oreos and kill them in the process. I'm not going to lie, one of the reasons that I love this video so much is because Oreos actually paid for it. It starts out like a typical sketch with one of Tom's friends being able to turn everything she points at into Oreos. It just starts off by pulling random pranks, then things get dark when they're surprised by another one of their friends and he gets turned into Oreos and dies. So in this paid advertisement, paid by Oreo, Tom Scott goes about trying to hide the body of a person who was murdered by being turned into Oreos. All the while, that beautiful Oreos jingle plays. This this is right up there with Tom's usual brain of humor, and I really do like it. It might be too dark for some people, and usually I'm not that into dark humor, but I really do like his. I guess the question that might be on your mind is, would a video with a guy being murdered by being turned into Oreos really make you want to buy an Oreo? That's a very stupid question. The video ends with the moon being turned into an Oreo. Of course it makes me want to eat a fucking Oreo. Oh boy, do I have some exciting news for you guys. Did you know that there's a sequel to Kiki's Delivery Service coming out? Yeah, they've even got a trailer and everything. Yeah, I know it's been like 10 or even 20 years since the original movie came out, but but this seems like a pretty legitimate trailer. It stars a 17-year-old Kiki. I mean, it seems to have a bit of a different art style, but quite honestly, it looks rather impressive. It really gets you excited for a long-awaited sequel to a really beloved movie. Then you realize that this is a commercial for ramen noodles. This is a revenge for questioning my choice in noodles during my Sabrina sketch, by the way. Yes, if you're wondering, this is from Nissan Cup Noodle, which here in the United States is most known for top ramen. I actually don't have much to say about this one, it's just just really fun to fake people out, but ignoring the fake out. While this is clearly in a different style than the original movie and was not drawn by Ghibli, albeit it was obviously licensed by them, it really does have high quality animation that I really do appreciate. It feels like not just a trailer, but a good trailer that an imagined Kiki sequel would have. It's nicely shot, it's really well edited, although from the story that I can tell, I don't think that a love story is the best choice for Kiki's Delivery Service. One of the most notable things about Kiki's Delivery Service is that it didn't have a love story. But as for what's actually here, I just admire the hard work that went into it. And a ton of it went into making a truly awesome trailer for a movie that doesn't even exist in the long-running quest to sell instant noodles. Honestly, I don't even know why Nissan has advertisements. As long as college is still a thing, they're gonna have loyal customers that legitimately cannot afford anything else. We all love Hypnospace so much, it rocks, it is the best. Sometimes, if you want people to buy your product, you've got to get a little creative. One of the most interesting strategies that I've ever heard of is only giving you the advertisement after you bought the product. Actually, that was meant to be a joke, but considering how money-grubbing the video games industry has gotten over the years, that's not really a joke. Many games nowadays are filled with advertisements for random or various products. Sports games are especially bad about this, but we both know that that's not what I'm talking about. It's an old-time marketing strategy, the free promotion. Buy our stuff and you get something free with it. Nowadays, it's usually in the form of buying the game and then getting parts of the game you purchased that were removed and locked on disc for free. Video games actually do have some really good promotions, though. The rule of thumb, of course, is that they need to be promotions from anyone but a video game company. If EA is offering you some kind of video game deal, you're getting scammed. If it's General Mills, you're about to make bank. This is probably common knowledge, but video games used to be cereal prizes, actually. Yeah, video games came free with cereal at one point in time, but this actually wasn't as rare as you might think. All kinds of companies had pack in video games way back in the day. Back in the Atari era, a literal dog food company made a game to sell their products. But sometimes, these promotions would give you, like, a real game. Like, an actually real good game. Some of the greatest video games of all time were actually given away as free promotions. Like, some of my favorite video games ever. Roller Coaster Tycoon and Age of Empires 2. Yeah, Age of Empires 2. One of the most influential real-time strategy games of all time, with a player base that continues to this day, was once given away for free with cereal. Most hilariously, the game Beyond Good and Evil sold so badly on release, it was given away for free with the purchase of cheese. Some companies, though, went the extra mile and made games themselves. Honestly, the world of advert games, as they're called, is really vast and actually kind of impressive. Not to spoil things, but there are going to be several on this list. Some of them have memetic status, like Pepsi Man. But have you ever tried to play Pepsi Man? It's not a good time. I guess it's a good advertisement, considering that people still know and remember this guy despite it being exclusive to Japan. <laughs> Mm. Uh, Pepsi.
especially for TV game. <laughs> but is it really hard to make a good game to show your product? Enter Chex Quest. I'm gonna be upfront with you and say that I've never actually played this one myself, and that is unfortunate, because it seems to be a really good game. It's a Doom clone, and Doom, while being a bit outdated, is a game that I still do enjoy and play every once in a while, although I will admit to being a quick guy primarily. From what I do know, Chex Quest seems to be a quality product. It's the real shit. Yeah, it's shamelessly based on Doom, but in this case, that's not a bad thing. Honestly, it might be one of the better things about it, actually. And I could imagine that that would have really helped its popularity back in the day. It's easy to forget this nowadays, but Doom was really controversial back in the day. It was bloody and violent, and it was all about fighting demons. It had parents up in arms, and not helping was it being scapegoated as a cause for the Columbine school shooting. Nowadays though, Doom is kinda campy in that regard. And of course, nowadays we're much more enlightened and we've stopped blaming video games for real world violence. <laughs> I have jokes. Anyway, Chex Quest was the family-friendly alternative to Doom. It had a much friendlier, much more cartoony palette, and the weapons were more abstractions than actual weapons. On top of that, healthy food restored your health. And I'm sure that many kids enjoyed this because they couldn't play Doom, either because their parents forbade it or because they just weren't ready for Doom themselves. Either way, Chex Quest lived on as a legacy. A free game meant to sell cereal eventually got two sequels and a cult following that exists to this day. Now that's how you make a good advertising campaign. Oh fuck no, that shit's garbage. I got a girlfriend using Hypnospace. Hypnospace. She's beautiful, I think she's really do PSAs count as advertisements? You know what? I'm gonna say yes. They work exactly like advertisements. They try all manner of tactics to stick in your brain, like commercials, and they are trying to sell you something. Usually it's a charity, but sometimes it's an idea or an action, or the lack of it, like abstaining from drugs or cigarettes. And like most commercials, they tend to be really, really bad and really annoying. Unlike commercials, though, PSAs have a habit of coming across as very preachy. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that one at some other time. So many commercials go just crazy making these over-the-top statements about drugs or alcohol, or drunk driving, or driving without a seatbelt, or some shit like that. And quite honestly, it's all really unnecessary. All you need to do is tell people that these are some really dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die. to die has been given a really mimetic status in the past couple of years, so people tend to forget that it's actually a PSA. I don't know if that's a good thing, showcasing how popular it is, or a bad thing, because people forgetting a PSA's point is usually a bad thing, but ignoring that, Dumb Ways to Die is a song and animation by an Australian train company about train safety. Actually, from what I can tell, it did help reduce train accidents for a fraction of the price of a traditional television PSA. I mean, it's a song so catchy that it charted in the Netherlands. If that doesn't reduce railroad accidents, nothing will. Of course, some people complained about it, and it did have its own brand of controversy. You can't make a brand without getting a brand of controversy. The main thing it was criticized for was trivializing injuries. And I don't really buy that. I mean, many of the non-train-related deaths in this song are largely improbable. Not many people are going around poking grizzly bears with sticks, or taking their helmet off in outer space. If you're doing stuff like that, you have other problems than a cartoon on the internet. It is a cartoon, and a lot of the short goes into cartoonish events and deaths. And I suppose that brings us to the other controversy here. A lot of the controversy of the short revolved around suicide. One part of it I kind of agree with, and one not so much. The part I agree with is that suicide is one of the bigger causes of railroad-related deaths, which this short kind of really ignores. The other criticism, though, is that the short encourages suicide, which I don't agree with at all. Both kidneys on the internet. It's really ridiculous and over the top all the way through. While a few things within it are technically imitatable, it's saying that these are things that you shouldn't do, and that you're a moron for doing them. These are the dumbest ways to die. And on the flip side, maybe people didn't know that you shouldn't get toast out of a toaster with a fork, or eat medicine that was out of date. Honestly, this is just something that's extremely hard to get offended by. It goes into all kinds of grisly deaths like Happy Tree Friends would. 
but somehow manages to remain cute and stay tasteful. It also goes into a rather important message without sounding preachy about it as well. You should be safe around trains. A part of the charm is probably because of the cute character blobs that look straight out of the Mr. Men show, but is there really anything else that needs to be said? I like trains. I made so many new friends because hips no space is cool. Wanna hear a story? Well, gather around, but I have to warn you, this one's not for the faint of heart. It actually used to be an old Halloween tradition of mine. And, if the circumstances were better, I would be talking about it around such a date. But, this strongly risks being forgotten, so it's best to talk about it when the opportunity arises. You've probably heard the phrase, nothing on the internet is ever truly lost. As time goes on, though, that saying seems to prove less and less true, to the point where it's probably the opposite of reality. And Anything solely on the internet is doomed to die before something solely in reality. Websites come up and disappear all the time. While the domains technically still exist, all someone has to do is not pay for hosting and everything that place hosted was gone. Copyright claims or private videos keep a large section of YouTube blocked off from the public. And of course, there's just plain old deletion, nothing you can do about that. A game that relies on internet access may as well have a timer on its practical use. Hell, at the end of 2020, Flash will no longer be supported on the internet and all three of the big browsers are blocking it from use. Which means an untold amount of web-based games and animations will probably no longer function properly. Best enjoy those mini-clip experiences while you still can. Of course, though, there were some games that vanished long before this. And one that sticks in my memory was the web game Hotel 626. It used every trick in the book to terrify you. Even from the name, 626 refer to the time that you could actually play it. The hotel was only open from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., nighttime. Once you checked in, the goal was simply to escape, but that was easier said than done. Hotel 626 had very high productions for a web game. It used live-action scenes with real special effects. This thing had a budget, and it was innovative as hell. To play the game to the fullest, you needed to have a webcam, a microphone, and an actual cell phone. Every single room of the hotel was some kind of puzzle or a challenge. Sometimes it'd be simple video game challenges. Take a picture of a ghostly maid with your camera, but you could only find her by tracking down her voice. However, it was innovative in the way that it used technology. At one point, to progress, you would literally have to sing to a demonic baby to get it to sleep, literally through your microphone, or else you'd get your face ripped off. At some point, you'd get an actual call, like on the cell phone call, telling you how to escape the hotel. Although, like the old song goes, you can check out at any time you want, but you can never truly leave. You'd get a call about a week later, saying that you've never really left the hotel. And of course, your webcam would take your picture during the time when the game tried to spook you. And to answer your question, no, I have no idea how any of this would make me want to buy Doritos. I don't think that question is ever gonna be answered. Yes, Hotel 626 was made by Doritos for I have no idea. And they had a sequel that came out the following year that wasn't nearly as good. It was called Asylum 626, and to play it, you had to enter promotional codes from bags of Doritos, which kind of broke the tone. One of the spookiest things about Hotel 626 was how little branding it actually had. Yeah, there was the Doritos logo on it, but playing through the game and what the game actually required you to do made you wonder what the hell Doritos was actually doing, considering it didn't seem to be trying to sell product. When the branding gets in the way, the horror just isn't as effective. Oh no, my chip company has sold out in their advertisement game. I have been betrayed! From a historical context though, Hotel 626 is very, very interesting. It could be seen as a commentary on our technology and how it's developing, how invasive that it's getting. It used everything about a default typical computer of the era, and it played on those fears. The game originally came out in 2008, and it was discontinued in 2011. And back then, people were a lot more concerned about their data and such. Nowadays, we give our phone number to companies all the time for things like two-factor authentication. It's just standard operating procedure. But this game showed what could really be done with that kind of stuff. It's a chill that certainly stuck with me and why I still remember this experience to this day. It's themes and fears that my generation used to wrestle with before we were pacified by convenience. Unfortunately, Hotel 626 cannot be played any longer. The only way you can experience it is through articles and remaining Let's Plays online. Doritos let the domain expire and no one has ever tried to recreate or imitate the game. And like a true haunted hotel, it has vanished into the ether, never to be seen or experienced ever again, just leaving you with the wonder of how real it all was. 
So if I had to ask Doritos just one thing, I would ask, please, please, would you bring back four cheese flavor? I really miss it, and it was my favorite flavor, and you guys discontinued it for no reason whatsoever. As for everyone else, I'm going to join you in part two. I've got the sudden urge to do some shopping. <laughs>